thank you so much for, for having here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, my name is Nama. I am an ophthalmologist, a glaucoma specialist by training. Um, and at Google, I work on a team that applies machine learning um, to medical images and medical data in general. And today, um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about some of the lessons and some of the challenges that we um, on the team have uh, learned, encountered and learned and identified um, throughout our work on trying to create this tool, right? So taking from the machine learning model to an actual tool, that the tool that Professor Stahl was, was talking about. Nama, oh yeah, perfect. Not working? Oh, it's fine now, not... thanks. Okay, okay, excellent, mm -hmm. sorry. So these are my financial disclosures. Okay, so um, machine learning is already all around us. Uh, whether we are aware of it or not, um, and is already uh, powering many of the tools, consumer facing tools that many of us, if not all of us are using on a daily basis. So from searching unlabeled photos in the photo app to using text sensitive um, email reply suggestions in the email or using a translation app. But machine learning or AI, AI has also showed a huge potential in healthcare. So not only the things that um, Professor Stahl has talked about, but uh, many others, so ophthalmology, but also cancer detection, um, skin cancer, breast cancer, um, radiology, MRI, and other things. And the beautiful thing, or the best thing about this technology is that it works not only in the hands of, of professors, um, machine learning researchers, but also in the hands of undergrads and even, even high school students can uh, uh, train machine learning models and get good results. And we have seen an explosion of publications in uh, scientific literature at the intersection of healthcare life sciences and machine learning in recent years. Um, but the translation has actually been much slower. So given that adoption of machine learning models in consumer facing products and this explosion in research in healthcare, one would expect uh, similar adoption in the healthcare space, like products that are powered by machine learning. But we have not seen that. So why, why is that? Why is this gap between expectations and reality? And we think we've identified a few, um, a few things. Um, I'll go over three that um, probably contribute or may contribute to this, to this gap. So let's start with number one. Uh, we call them myths, right? So things that we believe are true, but are actually not so true. So myth number one is more data is all you need for a better model. And diabetic retinopathy has been uh, mentioned a few times. This is also where uh, our team has started um, over five years ago. I was not part of, that, of the team back then, unfortunately, but they started with diabetic retinopathy. And what they did was they um, acquired 130,000 retinal images from uh, ret uh, diabetic retinopathy screening programs in the US and in India. They built a labeling tool and they onboarded, they recruited 54 ophthalmologists to sit down and look through these images and say whether um, they have or don't have diabetic retinopathy and what level of diabetic retinopathy. And if you can see here, there are 130 images, but there are uh, 880,000 diagnoses or labels um, connected to these uh, images. And um, I'll tell you in a minute why. And this means that each image had between three and seven labels or between three and seven ophthalmologists look at that image and say what they think. And that is somewhat because of what this slide represents. Um, and we call this the rainbow chart. And this is probably not so um, surprising to the ophthalmologists and physicians in the room, but it was definitely surprising to the engineers um, on the team. And what this represents, you can see on the, on the X axis is the different ophthalmologists that looked at their, the um, different images. On the Y axis is the fundus images. So each row represents the collection of labels or collections of diagnoses given for a given image. And you can see that there's a lot of disagreement. Um, and um, again, what was surprising that it's more subjective than we think, right? And retina specialists are in a good place. They have a very clear uh, severity scale for diabetic retinopathy and for AMD, but still there's a lot of 
integrator and integrator disagreement. Um, and as from my experience sitting down and, and labeling photos in my fellowship and then later in work, um, I often disagree with myself, right? So um, I get tired, I get hungry, I have a mood. Um, and again, this is retinopathy, which is easy. Think about glaucoma, right? We don't even have a good, uh, we don't even have a good definition for glaucoma. So all this is from, the, uh, from that first paper about diabetic retinopathy. And I wanna focus the attention on this figure from the paper that actually is very useful and doesn't get a lot of attention. And um, this figure represents our team's thinking, well, how much data do we actually need? And how much data is, is enough for training a good model? And what they did was, and you can see here on panel A, it shows the performance of the model as a function of the number of uh, images in the, in the data set, right? In the training data set. And they started with a few hundreds and you can see that as they added more data or as the data set that was trained on was larger, the perform performance uh, increased, but only until a certain point, right? At some point, the performance plateaus. So more data is better, right? We know that ML models are greedy and they need a lot of data, but more data and more data is not enough. At some point, the performance will plateau and there's something else that needs to be taken into consideration. And this brings us to panel B, which um, shows us the uh, performance of the model as a, as, a per, as a function of the number of images. So in the training data set for this, for this model, there were on, uh, on average four and a half images per, four and a half labels, four and a half diagnoses per image. And what, what, what the team did was they were thinking, let's see what happens if we decrease the numbers, the number of labels that we take, right? So we take less and less input, uh, less and less diagnosis per image, uh, making the ground truth a little bit more uh, noisy. And let's see what that does. And interestingly, when you decrease or when you make the data more noisy or the label labels more noisy for the training set, it didn't have much effect. But for the tuning set, which is the test, the set that you test uh, against while you uh, train the model, while you develop the model, um, it had a lot of, uh, it had a um, significant effect. So it's not just about the number of images, it's also about how the quality of your data, the quality of the labels that you are, uh, that you have that you train against. So given, um, given uh, limited resources that we all encounter, uh, it probably makes sense to invest in, the, in high quality ground truth for the tuning and the, um, the test set. And that's exactly what was the follow-up study that the team did. They, after publishing the first paper that was on par with ophthalmologists, they took a smaller tuning set graded deeply by retina specialists only who are the gold standard for this, right? For diabetic retinopathy um, um, diagnosis. And the model's performance actually increased and is now on par with retina specialists. Another different example of how, of how the quality of labels is uh, important and affects the performance is this um, other model, other work that our team has done. And what they did here was um, diagnosing DME from fundus images is um, not great because we use Health, uh, we use hard exudates as a proxy for the presence of edema, which is basically fluid, right? So it's not, a, it's not a great proxy. And what they did here was they gave the model as input the fundus photo, but the label of yes or no deb, uh, DME was taken from an OCT, which is a much better tool to diagnose fluid in the retina. And as you can see here, these dots represent what uh, human graders uh, per, how human graders performed detecting DME with fundus photos only, not seeing the OCT. And this is how the model performed. Look, can you see my uh, cursor? I hope you do. Okay, perfect. Um, how the model performs when the ground truth was of much higher quality, it came from, from OCT. So the first take home message here is it's not about, it's not just about the quantity of the data, it's also about the quality of the ground truth and the quality of the labels that you use when you train your model. Myth number two, so we have a model, we trained it with high quality data, it's very accurate, we're done, right? We don't need anything else, we have a good product, 
we can ship it to the world. Not really, because uh, what, you, what we try to do, right? We try to put the product or we try to put the model in the clinic and help healthcare workers. We wanna tr try to help uh, facilitate screening, right? But if the model is put in a product that is not fitted well with the um, workflow of the clinic, if it's, it becomes a burden on this nurse who's running the, uh, uh, the screening process, she will not use it, right? So we need to look very deeply into what makes a product useful in the clinic. Um, and this, this means running deployment research and trying, trying out different models and basically building the workflow to use these tools around what happens in the clinic and how it fits and how, how it integrates um, nicely. And these are examples from our um, deployment research that is done both in Thailand and India. And this, this study, we, had a, we did a prospective study trying to, uh, to figure all these things out in Thailand. It's coming out really soon. It's accepted, but it's not published yet. Um, and this is an example of, of how, how to do this or how we do it, right? So we have a, a big team. It's not just ophthalmologists. It's not just the nurses. We have a big team of human, of human computer interaction or human-centered interactions uh, researchers who look deeply into the, the workflow and um, map each and every person's, uh, each and every step along the way, um, trying to see how we optimize and where we place this uh, algorithm or where we place the product in order to get um, better, uh, better results. So it's not just about having an accurate model, it's about having a usable, usable model that can, or usable product, sorry, that can actually integrate into the workflow. Myth number three, a good product is sufficient for clinical impact. So we trained a model, we built a product, we made sure it fits into the workflow of the clinic. Are we done? Have we solved all uh, diabetic retinopathy problems in the world? No. Um, we place it in the clinic and if you manage to get into the clinic, you're fine. But what happens when you, and which is the case for many, many people around the world, don't even have access to the clinic, right? Some people need to, work, to walk three days to get to a clinic, to get to such a product. Um, so, and I think uh, Professor Stahl mentioned this, right? Going to rural places and um, trying to bring the product into the, into the, uh, to the places where people are, meeting people where they are. And... This will require a lot of health economics and outcomes research, right? To make, to understand how the system can incorporate such products and what are the costs, not only of the screening, but also of the downstream effects, right? Once we screen someone, then, then what? We wanna make sure they get treatment, right? We wanna make sure that there are good outcomes and that we preserve their vision. And this, um, um, this graph is from a, a paper and from a very nice work done by, um, researchers in Singapore, in the Singapore uh, Eye Research Institute, Dr. Uh, Professor Wong. And what they did was they, um, they compared three screening arms, one that was fully automated, uh, artificial intelligence only, one that incorporated both human and artificial intelligence, and one that was human only. And they compared the cost effectiveness of all three arms. And surprisingly, or maybe surprisingly, maybe not surprisingly, but interestingly, um, the arm that we used both human, that combined both human and artificial intelligence uh, proved in this study to be the most cost effective. So there's a lot of work to be done in this space to see how we actually realize this. And this has nothing to do with the models themselves or the artificial intelligence, right? The technology itself. It has to do with how this integrates into the broader system and, and, makes, and makes an impact. So it's not only about right, the, the, the model, it's also about how we impact the system. So in conclusion, um, label quality and ground truth are uh, critical to building accurate models. Um, Human-centered approach is required in order to make this product, to make these models into a useful product. And then um, implementation and health economics research is needed in order to bring these products into the world and make uh, clinical impact. So thank you so much for listening. Um, and I'm looking forward to a fruitful discussion and I'll hand it over to you. Thanks.